on the line with Peter with now. You're obviously a big hero to uh, many, many Villa fans. Um, uh, you know, you score, you've played for big clubs such as Villa, Nottingham Forest, Newcastle, and you've played for England, am I correct? Yes, that's quite true. And um, I want to talk to you about, uh, first of all, if, if, it's, if it's all right with you, the actual European Cup. I mean, you scored the greatest goal in the history of Aston Villa Football Club in the European Cup final in Rotterdam 1982. How did it feel when the ball went in the back of the net? Well, I mean, it's we sort of accumulated sort of a, a good run in the uh, Champions League or the European Cup as it is called then and then of course um, it culminated in playing against Bayern Munich who was one of the best teams at, the, at that time in Europe and um, you know to, for us to win it when they had sort of 13 international players on their books and we had sort of two international players was a tremendous achievement and for me to uh, sort of put the ball in the back of the net just culminated in uh, what we'd achieved as a, as a team as it were um, to actually score the goal of course was a tremendous uh, achievement for not only me, but just for the club itself, so, you know. I was just fortunate enough to get on the end of the cross. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that, that's that's what good centre forwards do, get in the right place at the right time, right? Well, that's what, I'm, that's what I was paid to do, to score goals and to get in the right place, and you're right, um, you know, and um, it was a great achievement for the club, and I think that uh, what we sort of achieved, winning the championship, uh, the year before, and then going on to win the, the European Cup, and then the following year, of course, to win the Super Cup, was uh, you know great memories. Barcelona, yeah, yeah. Um, really obviously, you know, Bayern Munich, as you say, were one of the best at the time. I mean, do you think Villa, uh, Aston Villa at that time, were the best European team? I mean, do you think they were the best team in the world when you won it? And, uh, you know, although uh, Bayern Munich had a very strong team, we had probably a very good, uh, committed team. And uh, we would, you know, we wanted to keep the flag flying because, as you know, that before us, Nottingham Forest had won it, Liverpool yeah. had won it, and we dominated the, you know, the 70s and the 80s, and uh, we wanted to keep that trend going. I mean, there were, that was a very, a very good side. I mean, who were the best players in the team? I mean, you look at players such as Dennis Mortimer, Gordon Cowan, of course, Tony Morley, who delivered that famous cross, and, you know, Gary Shaw as well. I mean, who, who, who were the best players in that team, do you think? Well, I, don't th I think that we were one of them teams that we were un unsung heroes. I think that we had, you know, if you look at sort of players in that team, the likes of Des Bremner, who didn't get a lot of publicity, was a hard-working... Uh, journeyman yeah. and we had you know a lot of players that probably didn't get the recognition that they, that they deserved and I think that as a team um, you know there wasn't you know you wasn't looking at a team and, and picking out outstanding individuals you were picking out a team that was you know gelled together and worked very very hard together and you know, that's why we achieved what we did. It, there wasn't really one player that you could point your finger at and said that, that was the reason why they achieved what they did. I think that you point the finger at, you know, 12, 15 individuals because that's what we used on a rotation basis. Uh, why we achieved what we did. And I think that, you know, you look at the way that the league goes at this moment in time, and you look at Aston Villa now at this moment in time, for us to achieve what we did with the amount of players that we had playing at that time yeah. was phenomenal. You know, because you looked at sort of 15 players, where now you're looking at playing 30 players in your squad. <laughs> yeah, sure. Press expected Ipswich to win the league, didn't they? And, um, you know, it was obviously, it yeah. was quite a big turnaround. Yeah, if you looked at, at the time when, when we played Ipswich, we lost in the FA Cup to Ipswich, and everyone was saying that Ipswich was the best side, and Ipswich had this and Ipswich had that. At the end of the day, 
we won the championship and we won it by, you know, four to five points. So you measured over 42 games at that time when we played in the league and we were the better team over 42 games. So unlucky to do. Okay, um, there's a question, uh, this is from a fan uh, that uh, asked this on Twitter. Uh, Dave Jones asks, if Ron Saunders had stayed at Villa, would he have built a dynasty on the foundations of the championship winning side? Well, I think that, I mean, one of the reasons why I joined Aston Villa was basically because Ron Saunders sold the club to me. Um, when I, I, had a, I had quite an interesting sort of spectrum of what I could... Um, I had probably about six teams at the time when I was leaving Newcastle uh, to sign for them. One of my one of the teams that I uh, sort of was vying for my signature was Everton, who was my childhood team. But Ron Saunders sold a concept to me. He said that I had a jigsaw puzzle, and I was the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle. I think if he would have stayed, uh, he would have certainly built from the foundation yeah. that he had and added uh, better players in a sort of a building process and I, it was just unfortunate that he wasn't given that opportunity to continue to build the team that he had I think that um, in my opinion if he would have stayed at the club he would have took the club uh, further and beyond uh, but you know, as you know in football, things change and things happen, and it's just unfortunate that he left at the time. I think that what the side that he built okay. uh, to, win, to win the championship and the side that he built to win the European Cup will always be remembered as his side. Yeah, surely. I mean, um, Ron Saunders obviously uh, was a great manager at the time, and I'm going to talk to you about your managerial career in a, uh, in a bit, but. Um, I just want to ask. Uh, there's a question. That's probably you know, a lot of Aston Villa, a lot of Aston Villa fans feel you're a great player. Many feel you deserve more England caps. I mean, do you think what, that Rob Greenwood should have maybe picked you more? Well, I, th I think that um, Rob Greenwood was a very good player, but he was in the they needed somebody who could uh, head the ball right in the back of the net and surely that was you uh, after that they never really found anybody did they well you look at now and this is a disappointing factor with regards to Aston Villa uh, you win championships so you win trophies because you have a striker that's going to score you 20 goals a season yeah and you might uh, have been a fine piece of juice unfortunately um, I was the last player to score 20 league goals for the for Aston Villa, which was back in 80-81 season when we won the championship. Wow, now, okay. If you're not, if you're not going to get a striker that's going to score 20 league goals for you, you're going to struggle to win championships. You need, you know, we had at the time, like myself, scoring 20 goals, Gary Shaw scoring 19 goals. I think you had midfield players like Gordon Cowan scoring, you know, 
double yeah. figures, 12 goals. You get Dennis Morton who scored in 12 goals. If you And you get Tony Morton who scored in 12 goals, or 15 goals a season, then you're going to win things. The unfortunate fact that is at this moment in time that they haven't got a striker that's going to score 20 goals for them. And they haven't got Nick Birdberry who's going to score double figure goals for them. So that's the problem that they've got at this moment in time, that because you haven't scored enough goals, don't win games. Right. You play 40 games a season, 50 games a season, 60 games a season. When I was at Nottingham Forest, we played 70 games in one season. Okay. Um, Peter, you, you came to uh, Vela as assistant manager to Dr. Joseph Wenglos. Tell us about your, your managerial career, because I, I know you're an international manager. The last five minutes we've got. Tell us about your managerial career. Yeah, okay. Well, I started really on my management um, lifestyle, as it were, with regards to I joined the Huddersfield Town as player. Well, my title, actually, was uh, player assistant manager. Okay. Um, and I was sort of 12 months there and then got an opportunity um, to come back to Aston Villa as the assistant manager, Joseph Engler, which I grabbed the chance for the simple reason that, you know, Aston Villa at the time was in my blood. I didn't, I spent five years as a player, which is the longest period that I spent with any team. And then I, given the opportunity to go back there, was a, you know, it was a great opportunity. I, th I just felt that it was a little bit unfortunate that uh, Joseph decided at the end of the season um, that he, d he didn't want to stay. And uh, that was an unfortunate factor. Um, I felt that we still had a few years. Um, yeah, all right. I mean, to sort of achieve, achieve things, and it didn't sort of materialize, really. And then I sort of went as the reserve team coach, and I've done many other roles at Aston Villa. But then was given an opportunity to go and coach Thailand national team, which is a, I felt was a a, um, a great opportunity sure. to sort of build that side. Uh, and spent five years. It ended up that I was supposed to be going for six months, but it, I ended up staying in Thailand for five years and achieved many things with them. Probably the most successful coach in the history of Thailand. You took um, the last 10 of the World Cup? Well, yeah, I ended up sort of taking them up to 65th in the world ranking, and now they're about 135th in the world ranking. <laughs> and then sort of, I left them in... Um, I went to Indonesia and coached there for sort of three and a half, four years. Uh, and again, thought that I built a, a successful winning tie. Um, but it sadly left them as well. So I've, I've probably had a very successful side at the time in Asia. And sort of over a nine-year period, built two teams that I felt that uh, was capable of of matching anyone in, in the Asian region. Okay, sure. I, I mean, uh, obviously, you've had a very successful um, time as a manager in Asia. I mean, obviously, football must be pretty big there. I mean, I always, you know, I think the question in many of our lips is, do, do, we ever, do you think we're ever going to see you back in England managing? Or, you know, Britain? Well, you never, I never ever say, never, never. And there is, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity that arises, I've, I've sort of uh, lived in Perth at this moment in time, but if there's an opportunity that arises in the UK, then I jump at the opportunity because people probably think that they write it off because you've been out of uh, the UK. But I keep in touch with all the UK um, games. I watch all the games. I still keep abreast of things that happen. My sons keep me abreast of things that happen. My eldest son, Jason, um, you know, is involved in football, so he took me a bit. So, you know, I never say never. If there's an opportunity that arises anywhere in the world, whether it be in the UK or whether it be anywhere else, I would relish the opportunity to uh, give it another crack. Great, Peter. Uh, thanks for that today. All right. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thanks.